what we will take you through is essentially a problem based learning discussion so let us look at a 55 year old male with type 2 diabetes mellitus uh, we initially thought we'll do the pacemakers thing also together and uh, this was entirely one of our residents dr dilip so dilip's idea was that uh, because we, with their exams looming in front of them to have something with diabetes so i said like okay we'll do it that way maybe take in uh, pacemakers but i think we uh, let's see how it goes may we may or we may not have pacemakers in all right so what we will try and do is uh, with uh, diabetes we'll try and figure out what are the diagnostic criteria for diabetes then i think a lot of the focus you will realize will be about the preoperative preparation and evaluation of such a patient uh, when he comes in for surgery we'll talk also about perioperative glycemic control and how you do glucose monitoring but you will realize that all this ultimately becomes a very small part of the discussion uh, than i think the second part which is uh, 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 basically evaluation so what is diabetes uh, well the term diabetes essentially describes several diseases of abnormal carbohydrate metabolism Uh, which are characterized by and this is uh, uh, this is a textbook kind of a definition uh, which is also at the cdc cdc is right now everybody knows about cdc for the wrong reasons uh, about characterized by hyperglycemia or and a relative or an absolute impairment of insulin secretion along with or varying degrees of peripheral resistance to the metabolic effects of insulin so these are the three things which are essentially part of this disease conundrum hyperglycemia a relative or an absolute impairment of insulin secretion if you go by this definition you'll figure out that it is kind of alluding to the types of diabetes that we know of and also varying degrees of peripheral resistance to the metabolic effects of insulin okay so then if you realize you have this type 1 diabetes type 2 diabetes and you can have this entire conundrum they can be having hyperglycemia impaired glucose tolerance test and also they can start off with just a normal glucose regulation and you also have the other types and chief among them that we hear about is gestational diabetes so when do we label someone as having diabetes okay dilip since you are the one that so when do you call i have given you uh, essentially three columns or possibly even the fourth column okay and there are certain rules you have a normal person you have a pre diabetic you have a diabetic and you have somebody with gestation so and if i if you have access to all these reports when do you say that somebody is normal at what uh, glycosylated levels at what fasting uh, sugar levels and at what oral glucose tolerance test or postprandial water water that you think so when do you call somebody per, uh, normal diabetic a normal person the uh, normal person uh, when he tests uh, his fasting it comes down to less than uh, uh, 126 and uh, if it's 126 mg per deciliter okay okay is, uh, if is uh, uh, post prandial uh, comes out to be less than 140 mg per deciliter and if is random blood sugar comes out to be less than 200 mg per deciliter and if is hemoglobin a1c levels are less than 6.5% so you this is when you say uh, it, this is person is normal all right yes remember yes. we have got another uh, a row over there which is a pre diabetic row yes sir so normal and this is this is not something that this grid is not mine this is directly from the uh, american diabetic association okay i let me start off this okay normal as per them is when a glycosylated is less than 5.7 with a fasting of less than 100 which is what i think you said and a oral glucose tolerance test which is less than 140 mg per dl right okay now you can all 126 sir 1 126 so this is ada I, I, this is not me okay 
if if, if your one twenty six is from what data? Uh, sir, this one twenty six is from Harrison. Actually, sir, there is a there is a uh, very, so uh, so yeah, uh, yeah uh, yes, absolutely. You will uh, figure yeah. out that a lot of yes, thing about diabetes is not uh, absolute. So if you are saying one twenty six from Harrison, be absolutely sure that you are from Harrison. Okay. So when do you call somebody pre diabetic? Sir, pre diabetic as per Harrison, what he says is that uh, it, the uh, oral glucose uh, uh, tolerance test when we do. It should be in between hundred to one twenty six. Okay. And glycosylated. Uh, but sir, the glycosylated sir, it should be less than uh, sir for the pre diabetic. Actually, there is no uh, definitive uh, this thing. Uh, okay. uh, proper cutoff of hemoglobin A one C. They have just mentioned it that if it is greater than six point five, then the patient will be termed as diabetic, and if it is not, then it is it will termed as the non uh, normal. Thing. Okay. Let's but see what ADS says. There is no cutoff. Let's see what ADS says. ADS says that pre-diabetic is between this normal and diabetic, 5.7 to 6.4. And I think this is what I think they have merged it, if I can understand, is this 100 to 125, which I think you were alluding to was 126. So somebody takes something from somewhere, okay. And this is 140 to 190. So essentially, when do you call somebody diabetic, therefore? Uh, diabetic, obviously, when the uh, uh, fasting glucose is greater than uh, 126. Correct. Yeah, and uh, 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 HbA1c greater than 6.4. Okay. And, and uh, if you are doing just uh, a random sugar, which is above 200, so this by the ADA definition is what is diabetes. All right. So. If you want to label somebody as diabetes, I think that this is now you think that this is kind of getting similar to what even Harrison says, right? Isn't it? Yes, sir. A glycosylated above 6.5, a fasting uh, uh, sugar which is above 126 milligram per DL uh, or 7 millimoles per liter or whatever you want to say or a oral glucose or a tolerance test or a random sugar which is above 200. And when do you call somebody as having yeah, gestational no. diabetes? Uh, uh, so gestational diabetes. Uh, uh, I need to go through because I. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 so see, as per the ADA, the gestational diabetes is when the fasting sugar is above 126 again, and if again the oral glucose tolerance test is around that 153 to 199. Okay. So. I know these are again numbers and numbers are something which doesn't come naturally to or normally to me, but then you will have to remember this. But at least the red box, I think it is worthwhile to remember a glycosylated above 6.5, a fasting above 126, uh, uh, oral glucose or tolerance test or a random plasma sugar, which is above 200. So. I think this is an important slide sir, for uh, exam going. Sorry to, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, sir, once again. Sorry. Yes. Uh, sir, in ninth uh, edition Miller, uh, they have stated that uh, the values are completely different, sir. If we, uh, even if we are uh, comparing with the ADA or even if we are comparing with the Harrison, because in the ninth edition Miller, what they have given is that uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, pre, uh, the fasting sugar level, if they are greater than 110, then he will be labeled as diabetic. And if uh, the, just uh, uh, yeah, if that's the, fine, is, yeah, just fine. Just check out. Uh, I I'm sure Miller would have given reference to what they are quoting from. Yes. Sir. So just figure it out and let me know. Yeah. Okay. And let let us proceed. Okay. 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 So let us come back to our patient. Okay. This is this 55 year old male with type 2 diabetes mellitus who is on oral hypoglycemics and he's on reasonable control and. Uh, there was a syncope five years back for which a DDD pacemaker was in, inserted and is symptom free from then. There is no history of angina, palpitation, shortness of breath and the plan is an open inguinal hernia repair. Okay. Okay. Now, this is I think something that is a vexing problem. Is it the sugar that causes the problem in a patient with diabetes or the real problem lies somewhere else and I think that is essentially the the key to evaluation and managing a diabetic patient and if you realize as you go on that 
it is pointless to challenge those numbers but to identify the real problem which can which is causing the problem to the person it's not the numbers remember which is causing the problem so how do you identify the problem so the problems that are is again with either what the disease is doing to the various organs or the association of the disease with certain other metabolic problems so the comorbidities which complicate perioperative care are the cardiovascular disease the association strongly with obesity and again things like hypertension neuropathy nephropathy and these leads to the complications and this is something that you need to work on okay so this is i think what i think everybody knows so when you're looking at preoperative preparation and then you're looking obviously at evaluation so what are you trying to evaluate you figure out you are trying to evaluate two things the story of the diabetes and the organs that are affected now what are you trying to figure out from this diabetic story what kind of diabetes it is and i think this is the easiest to figure out then yes you want to figure out how good or bad the level of blood glucose control it has been what kind of medication regime this person has as and does the person have something which uh, people have started recognizing a lot these days is hyperglycemia per se without a diagnosis of diabetes and why it is important to realize that you'll soon realize because this group of patients can be extremely troublesome okay and the organs affected i find it easier to just remember and classify it this way as the macrovascular disease problems like the coronary artery disease the cerebrovascular disease the peripheral vascular disease all kind of related to atherosclerosis and the microvascular disease or the small vessels which is causing the retinopathy nephropathy neuropathy and if you realize if you realize that there are certain things which becomes uh which are more important than the others and you will be really bothered about things like a coronary artery disease you should be bothered a little bit about cerebrovascular disease when it is apparent and definitely nephropathy but when you realize that neuropathy which takes up the bulk and also has got to do as to how you tweak your anesthetic technique as well or how you manage the anesthetic bit of it okay level of blood glucose control how do you evaluate you obviously try and find out if you know their history and record what has been the range of blood glucose level that this uh, person has been sailing through what has been the average over the last three months six months uh, knowing the glycosylated hemoglobin levels definitely help and but i think it is here that you possibly can spend a little bit of time with the person as to have they experienced something like an hypoglycemia are they aware of something like that it has ever happened to them how often has it happened at what glucose levels if they have been checked uh, that's that happened and what has been the severity of symptoms now why are we trying to find this out uh, the reason we are trying to find this out is obviously that it can be helpful in reducing or deducing how much of the insulin dose that we need to tweak in the preoperative period and maybe we just don't stick to whatever all textbooks tell you but individualize for this patient that this is possibly a good perioperative blood glucose target for this particular person so this is why you need to evaluate the level of the blood glucose now why do you want to know the blood glucose levels except to figure out that uh, well this person is good control not good control you see it, the, there is something with the blood glucose level the same thing with the blood glucose control which can influence outcomes and there has been enough studies which have found a direct correlation between elevated glycosylated levels and adverse events like <laughs> infections in the perioperative period and uh, worse cardiovascular outcomes after cardiac and non cardiac surgery okay and uh, these are these are just a few of those references so there is enough to tell you that elevated glycosylated levels are about so that is why you want to know 
and that is why you know you one of the reasons you do an investigation is is there a scope in optimization or uh, is there a scope in risk stratification is that essentially that you can say that this is what may happen and also very preoperative hyperglycemia has been found to be harmful in the perioperative setting and i did not tell you that this is true because there is enough 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 evidence in literature to suggest that but then you know that preoperative hyperglycemia is bad you know that uh, glycosylated hemoglobin levels if it is elevated is bad but how bad is bad so what do the guidelines tell you is it just above 7 that it is bad is it just above 8 that it is bad or somebody has to be a glycosylated hemoglobin above 10 that it is bad or is it that preoperative hyperglycemia you said that it okay as long as they are below 150 they are right but if it is above 200 they are bad so what do the guidelines tell you you see the ada has not made any specific recommendations that this is the amount above which it is high the Australian Diabetes Association guidelines recommend that you should delay surgery if the glycosylated hemoglobins are above 9%. The Association of the Anesthetist of Great Britain and Ireland says that uh, you should delay elective surgery for if the preoperative glycosylated hemoglobin is greater than 8.5%. Uh, the Joint British Society says that it should be referred to an endocrinologist if the glycosylated hemoglobin is level above 8.5%, but they never say that uh, you have to delay. It has to be individualized. So I think what Dilip was also talking about when you're talking about numbers, I think the whole world uh, is not only in a flux with COVID, but there have been a flux with uh, the amount, the what is the number that you should assign for diabetes, glycosylated hemoglobin, sugar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, how good is GAD and what is good? You you look at it. There is no reliable data as of now to suggest that by achieving a specific glycosylated hemoglobin level or a very specific fasting blood glucose level or a preoperative blood glucose level in the preoperative period which will definitely definitely uh, improve postoperative outcomes so this is unfortunately like uh, like the analogy i give is that okay somebody has coronary artery disease you say that the risk of adverse uh, postoperative event will be less if the resting heart rate is 70 or below if the heart rate is above 90 with a person with coronary artery disease he or she is likely to have a adverse event more likely okay unfortunately for diabetes we still do not have such specific numbers and this is something that is not my figment of imagination this is from the mother of all uh, evidence base and Cochrane database tells you that there is no preoperative levels or specific numbers by which you can say that if it is below this the person is going to do well so we still don't know what is good and what is bad. And in fact, well, well, well. I think Shom Shindu. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So let us give you a scenario like this. Okay. There is uh, this patient has come to your pre-anesthetic clinic a couple of weeks before an elective surgery. Maybe say, for example, this particular gentleman or an open hunger. You find that the fasting blood sugar level is above 200. And he also possibly may have a glycosylated hemoglobin level above 9. What will you do in this scenario? What will your advice be? So, uh, since uh, this is an elective surgery, hmm. uh, I'll advise the patient to consult an endocrinologist and get his advice uh, regarding what to start, what to do, what modifications he need to do, what drugs he need to take up, and then come back to me uh, with the uh, reference from the endocrinologist, what he has to advise. So, what are you trying to achieve? I, uh, I, I want to. I would agree with you. I want to see. Uh, as a, I want to optimize him first, uh, as much as possible, with the endocrinologist's opinion, and then proceed for surgery. Okay. So yes. You consult with a clinician for a re-evaluation if it is feasible. 
And why are you trying to do this is that you definitely want this, all right? You do not want a severe perioperative hyperglycemic or even a hypoglycemic response, right? Okay. So yes. this is essentially is to overall improve the overall patient's diabetic management, right? And uh, yes, sir. this is where I think the glycosylated hemoglobin can become important because this is where you can possibly uh, make this call about is it just hyperglycemia with an unknown diabetic or an undiagnosed diabetic or is it just a non-diabetic person with a stress-induced hyperglycemia. Yes. Okay, so this is where I think you are absolutely right. So this is one of the reasons why you want an endocrinology consult if you see numbers like this with or without symptoms coming in. So uh, now when do you proceed with the scheduled surgery? I think mean, this is a vexing problem. Now, do you wait for this glycosylated hemoglobin to come down? And if you want the glycosylated hemoglobin to come down, would you want to want it to come down to what? Less than 6.5 or less than 7, 7.5? I think this is where I think there is, you will find a huge uh, difference of opinion among various various people uh, many people would say as long as my blood sugar levels come down to around less than 180 i would be good enough to go for a glycosylated hemoglobin because my glycosylate uh, if my mm, uh, fasting blood sugar levels comes down to around 120 or at least less than 150 and uh, do not wait for the glycosylated hemoglobin because the glycosylated hemoglobin to come down will take maybe months, six months to years. And this was a very elegant study with where they did about uh, in a, a hip replacement featured. So now there is, could be another scenario wherein this person has not come in for a pre-anesthetic checkup, but is coming to your preoperative holding area. And you find that the pre uh, glycemic control is bizarre. You, uh, uh, you find that the blood sugar level is around, say, 270. And uh, this, then you have to figure out whether you want to delay this surgery based upon the physical state. And then they would obviously be coming in for something like a time sensitive or an emergency surgery. And at this level, which is the second scenario that you're giving, not a very elective, not in, a, uh, not in the uh, somebody you see a couple of weeks or many uh, a month before, but you're just few hours before the surgery, maybe maybe 30 minutes, maybe four hours. At that point of time, if you see something that you cannot delay the surgery, then what can you do? Then you have to actually figure out whether this is with this high blood sugar level, do they have anything to suggest that the person is in ketoacidosis or in hyperosmolic hyperglycemic clona? If they are not in a proper mentation state, it is easy, but if they're talking, it is still possibly a worthwhile to figure it out. How do you figure out diabetic ketosis or hyper? I think the easiest is to possibly do a blood gas and find out if the pH is low or if you have an ability to look at the osmolarity that, or if you have the inability to look at the base excess or the anion, if calculate the anion gap, then you can possibly figure out. So if it is something like a diabetic ketoacidosis or a hyperosmolar coma, and if it is so, obviously a non-emergency surgery has to be postponed and you give appropriate treatment. We'll come to this appropriate treatment right at the end. But if it is no, and if you need an urgent surgery and you find that the glycemic control is bizarre, say even if, say a random blood sugar of 300, then what do you do? That time that you have is you start the treatment which is essentially with an IV insulin, boluses or infusion, fluids as is indicated. Proceed with the planned surgery which is the urgent surgery because for all you know it is the pathology for which the person is needing surgery that is causing this bizarre hyperglycemic response. The hyperglycemic management continues in the intraoperative period and it is at this point of time that you have an endocrinology consult so that appropriate therapy is continued in the post-operative period. So I gave you two scenarios to figure out what you need to do. Okay, so the medication management, you're talking about essentially two types, the pharmacological oral hypoglycemic agent and obviously insulin. So I will give you the list of the oral hypoglycemic agents. You have to tell me in the each groups, what are the oral hypoglycemic agents that we know of? 
So I've given you on the left hand side the pharmacological groups. So sulfonylureas would uh, what are I, you give me at least one or two maximum common names for this drugs. Sir, uh, sulfonylureas are uh, divided into first generation, second generation. Uh, mm -hmm. First generation can be tolutamide, tolzamide, and uh, second generation may be lipazide and glyburide. Okay, bigonides. Metformin. Sir, bigonides. Very good. Meglitinides. Rosiglitinides. Just two. I would Rapaglinide. just. Okay. Thiazolidines. Bioglitinides. Okay. Very good. Very good. Excellent. DP4 inhibitors. Okay. This is all these gliptins and the carbos are the next one, the sodium glucose co-transporters inhibitors or the, sorry, the alpha glucosidase inhibitors. And then you have the uh, sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitors and uh, alpha glucose is the acarbose or megaliton. And what are those non-insulin injectables? Okay. These are the exanatides, pramlitides or largulitides. All right. Now the question is, suppose these patients are on oral hypoglycemic agents. Preoperatively, when do you stop them? In the morning, it has to be stopped. You stop it in the morning, okay? Uh, suppose uh, I have a person who is to be operated in the evening, electively. And uh, so the person will be getting uh, breakfast. Well, what will you do for that? Will you give the morning dose? You will not give the morning dose. I think the universal way that people are kind of figuring out is when do you stop them is you stop them from the time they are fasting. So if they're fasting from the overnight, you do after that evening, those do not give anything in the morning. So if they have a dose, which is at 7 a.m., but they're having the breakfast at 9 a.m., you can think about giving it at 7 a.m. also. And uh, uh, this, the only thing was conformin of those 48 hours. Otherwise, I think now the, it is the consensus opinion that you hold dose from the time they are fasting. So I'll give you the types of insulin. You have to give me the names of those insulin. What they are stating is that uh, regarding the oral hypoglycemia, when they need to be uh, stopped. Uh, mm -hmm. sir, does ADD says that it should be stopped since the patient is fasting? Because Miller very clearly says that uh, these drugs should be stopped one day prior to the surgery. And regarding the half dosing since fasting, that is being given for the insulin. Sir. For oral so we'll come to insulin. I think, I think let us not confuse ourselves. I think you will go by the even by old standard text. Oral hypoglycemics, okay. the only issue has been with fenformin. With others, yes, sir, metformin. With others, hold, keep, you should have, they should be having it till their the last meal. After, after they stop eating, no oral drugs. Okay? Let's not confuse ourselves on this. Okay. Long acting insulin. Glargin. Uh, okay, very good. Intermediate acting. Lispro and. Okay, it's, it's very simple. Eh? The NPH or the zinc. Short acting or rapidly acting. As far as Lispro. Don't give me trade names. Communist is a regular, isn't it? Regular. Okay, right. Pre mixed. Human mixed start. Okay, so whatever, the neutral protamine, hackatron, the whatever, the mixtures, okay. And the continuous subcutaneous insulin? Regular insulin. The insulin schwamps. So now the question comes, I think it was much easier for the guy who was answering the oral hypoglycemic agents. What about this insulin? When do you stop? And when do you stop? So if somebody is on a long-acting insulin, when do you stop? What do you do? The long-acting insulin, they say that 24 hours morning, if the surgery is posted in the morning, we have to mm -hmm. start 24 hours before the elective surgery. If it is a morning procedure and the person gets a long-acting insulin, uh, people, there are people, I think now they, they're cur currently coming towards this, that you give the entire morning dose. If it is going to happen a little later okay. on and you may not be able to monitor, it is then that you cut down the long-acting insulin by half. 
all right and uh, you reduce the evening dose if there is a history of hypoglycemia okay so on, so since you're going to monitor because you because what people have realized is if you don't do this it is then you find this huge variability of the uh, glycemic response okay so long acting if it is early in the morning you can you should be giving the entire dose i know even there are uh, or there has been some people who would advocate that if it is something like they get it at early in the morning uh, most often you will don't see that they are getting it early in the morning if they get in the evening it is absolutely fine that they get the whole dose in the evening prior intermediate acting what do you do is that you reduce it to 50 to 75 percent of the usual morning dose and reduce evening dose if you find that in that evaluation you found that there is too much of history of hypoglycemia what about the short acting drugs stop uh, short acting yes. in the morning. absolutely more absolutely if there is fasting hold it what happens with the pre-mixed if they're on pre-mixed um uh, pre-mixed also night dose uh 50 to 75 percent can be but, uh, so 50 to 70 percent of which one in the pre-mixed this is the this is the uh, catch long. on this correct do not if the pre if you do not use the premix if they're going to go in for surgery of the intermediate acting use half or three fourths of them do not try not to give the premix but go to the uh, the intermediate acting and not use the short acting so that you don't uh, find an episode of hypoglycemia uh, while the person is fasting and continuous you can continue this subcutaneous in, in the on an insulin pump essentially okay so this kind of sums up what we need to do for insulins and when to stop insulins prior to surgery. The evaluation of hyperglycemia without the diagnosis of uh, diabetes is important because you find that this has been now in evidence that common and adverse events are more common than in the person with diabetes and they can be more severe and they can be with varying degrees of hyperglycemia. and. Uh, since they are not picked up then, you will find that obviously all these microvascular and macrovascular complications are more because these organ systems have not been optimized because they were not even aware about their hyperglycemic response. So now coming to the evaluation of multi-organ systems, you will find that this again as we mentioned, the macrovascular disease and the microvascular disease. Let's look at where these things are important for our perioperative management. Coronary artery disease and diabetes, I think it's an independent factor, diabetes for coronary artery disease and people with diabetes and coronary artery disease, there is two times likelihood that they can have a sudden cardiac death. The other side of the spectrum where because they're diabetic, their coronary artery disease may not be evident, can remain asymptomatic, they're at a much higher risk of heart failure and poor perioperative outcomes. Uh, if you look at everything the risk assessment tools that we commonly use for a person with coronary artery disease going in for a cardiac or a non-cardiac surgery the just the sheer association of diabetes you'll find the risk index going up whether it is the lee's revised cardiac risk index or the uh, vascular study group of new england's risk index or the american college of surgeries nsqp calculators you'll find just by the very presence of diabetes risk so essentially if there is somebody with uh, diabetes, what people will tell you is try and poke and find out whether they have any symptomatology which is suggestive of coronary artery disease or maybe even if they don't have symptoms, you might investigate to find out if they have a, a latent coronary artery disease. Same thing with cerebrovascular disease is an independent major risk factor for stroke and they are twice as prone to a stroke, ischemic stroke than a person without diabetes and it is essentially it is all to do with this burden of atherosclerosis. Uh, peripheral vascular disease they can come to you for a revascularization or an amputation it is all again to do with this burden of atherosclerosis and therefore since they have an atherosclerosis of a bigger vessel think that they can have an atherosclerosis by coronary artery or a cerebrovascular uh, cerebral vessel and also have the microvascular things like neuropathy nephropathy keep that in mind so anybody who comes in for peripheral arterial surgery or a peripheral vascular surgery you find diabetic keep that you uh, again you make leading questions to rule out these 
associated complications. Neuropathy is the most common complications. 50% of the person with diabetes with even reasonably good control will develop neuropathy with abnormal nerve conduction, which can have overt clinical manifestations. At times, they cannot have. Classically, this is uh, very theoretical. They can have things like distal symmetric polyneuropathy, autonomic neuropathy, polyradiculopathy, focal mononeuropathies, mononeuropathy multiplex. So what is, why are we bothered about diabetes, neuropathy and anesthesia? You find that this, they can influence what, the way we practice anesthesia. Because these people will have a higher chance of a cardiovascular instability. They can have delayed gastric emptying, which is where you can have to may have to tweak your uh, anesthesia technique. Uh, they have, they are more prone to have a risk of injury, nerve injury, or uh, even uh, soft tissue injury during positioning of surgery. So you need to figure it out and be careful about it. And they have this increased sensitivity to the local anesthetics that we use. It, it is, if I even bring it down and say diabetes patient with peripheral neuropathy coming in for a for a regional anesthetic procedure what are our concerns you find that there is an increased nerve stimulation threshold in this group of people and it may not be very ideal if you're just using the stimulation threshold or the peripheral nerve stimulator threshold to guide a regional anesthesia because they might have a, a much increased threshold and you might still increase the ampere and lead to damage so in these situations, a diabetic patient ultrasound is the preferred choice more than anybody else. There is this increased sensitivity, which many people uh, do not pay heed to. But I think it is worthwhile to remember that there is an increased risk of nerve damage in this population than in the non-diabetic. And you have to be aware that there is duration of peripheral nerve blocks may be prolonged. So what is your clinical implication because of this? You have to minimize the local anesthetic dose, either the concentration or the volume or both, and definitely not use a vasoconstrictor agent along with the local anesthetic solution. So there is something very hardcore about peripheral neuropathy, diabetes, and how you manage regional anesthesia. Diabetics, autonomic neuropathy, and anesthesia. What are the things that you need to be worried about? It is nearly the entire gamut of the systems, whether it is cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, genitourinary, pupillary, pseudomotor, vasomotor, neuroendocrine. And what are the things that you are looking for because of this uh, associations are, do they have resting tachycardia? Do they have poor exercise tolerance? Some, this is, I think, classical. Do they have orthostatic hypotension and supine hypertension? Does they have early satiety? Do they have features of gastroesophageal reflux disease? Do they have alternating constipation, diarrhea, erectile dysfunction, and uh, a common association with uh, OSA? So again, somebody with diabetes, these are the things that your focused examination has to go and find out or a focused history taking has to look at these things. What these can lead to in the perioperative period because of this autonomic neuropathy, because this is why, because these all have significant implications, which is why you need to figure out from those leading questions, because you can have significant hypotension on induction of anesthesia or any change in position. So making a steep uh, reverse Strandlinenberg, you can lead to an hypotension, okay? Uh, the blood pressures may be very labile, and you have to be more adept in using vasopressors to maintain the blood pressure in this group of individuals. Same thing with neuroaxial anesthesia, the hypotension may be more pronounced. You might have to be more aware of it and use vasopressors at a much early time and also with changes in posture. Uh, autonomic neuropathy, that was cardiovascular. GI system, we, rest, we understood that there could be delayed gastric emptying. So there is this increased risk of aspiration during anesthesia. The clinical implication, you might have to think about tweaking your fasting duration, maybe more than that. 
and your method of induction intubation you might have to take recourse to uh, rapid sequence induction intubation and uh, if they have things like constipation which is predominating uh, definitely minimize the use of opiate in your multimodal operative things so essentially there are things which you need to tweak with your anesthesia with nephropathy again uh, it, when you are talking about uh, coronary artery disease remember for all those risk stratification for adverse cardiac events we said that association of diabetes is good enough, uh, is strong enough. You will find in all those, whether it is Lee's car reverse cardiac invents or the vascular surgery group of New England or the American College of Surgeons NSQIP data, you'll find CKD is an independent predictor. So the presence of CKD will say that it for helps in immune risk stratification. And this bit is, I think, for much easier to understand that your perfusion pressures may need to be higher. So if you think for a normal person, you have a good thing going with a, a MAP of 60 to 70. In this group of patients, you know that since their uh, reset is much higher, that you know what their baseline uh, pressures have been, your perfusion pressures intraoperatively should be at that. You obviously uh, very intuitive, not have, uh, use uh, nephrotoxins. And this is, I think, a vexing problem, which will remain. I don't know whether we'll get an answer to this, is if they would be on ACE or ARBs, to stop or not to stop, I think it will have to be uh, very, very individualized based upon individual institutional protocols. Uh, uh, what people have kind of decided uh, as of date is if it if the ACE or ARB was started for an hypertensive episode, it is possibly worthwhile to continue with that. If it was started for a heart failure reason, it is worthwhile to continue with that. If it was just for a kind of uh, protective mechanic a reason, then you might omit. Uh, retinopathy in anesthesia, there is an increased risk of uh, uh, post-operative visual loss and uh, it can be due to positioning that there is increased chances. And many people suggest that now this is open to uh, interpretation that you can possibly do a pre-operative visual equity and visual field assessment before taking these patients up if you have retinopathy on. What in the musculoskeletal uh, uh, problem, in the musculoskeletal, uh, problems? Uh, would you be worried about? Uh, would you be worried about? Sir, TM joint ankylosis. Okay, so what are you worried about? Okay, so what are you worried about? And uh, deformities. And uh, TM joint ankylosis sir, will lead to uh, reduced mouth opening. So you are worried about the airway? That will cause a difficult yeah, airway situation. worried about the airway? Yes, sir. Difficult airway situation, and uh, al along with that, there can be a uh, atlanto axial uh, joint uh, uh, ankylosis. Okay, that will also cause a difficulty in the airway management. Okay, <clears throat> how will you figure out that the airway is? Uh, is how there any sign? Of... The airway is. Uh, is there any sign or... uh, that you can elicit? So uh, there is a palm print sign and the a prayer sign is there, sir. Very good, excellent. So the other very thing is positioning. So, yeah, so the other good. thing is we'll positioning. About that. So, yeah, very good. so the prayer sign and the palm print sign. Sign and the palm print sign. Yes, sir. Okay. What about positioning? Okay. What about positioning? So, uh, in uh, positioning, so we can see the if the uh, occiput is touching the uh, uh, if the patient uh, occiput is touching the bed or if he is requiring pillows. Mm -hmm. So, is there something that you can do? Is there something that you can do? Okay, so neck me, extension. So, we can do a. Okay, let, me, uh, let me give you a scenario. Suppose this is a diabetic person, and he tells you that he has also problems with his shoulder joint, and uh, there is a fracture of the distal uh, radius, and you plan to give a brachial plexus block, and uh, so before you do the block would you do something and then give the block because you are worried about positioning so uh, if the patient has a, uh, a shoulder joint pain uh, so we'll keep the patient uh, positioned in the uh, up in a semi reclined position okay okay anyway and, uh, just the positioning what has been uh, what people would say is this is something that you can try is that before you do the block or whatever you put the person in that anticipated position that the person is going to and figure out 
that the person can stay in that anticipated position. I give you a hint. Suppose he has a shoulder capsulitis and you're going to make him lie down like this. Is he going to lie down like this with this position after you have given a block? which is called the trial position before sedation or induction of anesthesia. This is something that you have to keep in mind when you are dealing with such a situation. Okay. So what investigations will you do? I think if you have done, if you have not done glycosylated hemoglobin and you do not know the volume, this is one thing. The other things that you can do is the, because of the strong uh, atherosclerotic burden uh, problem, fasting lipid profile is something. And liver function test is again to figure out the synthetic functions that is uh, uh, not been impaired or not, which can lead to. And this is something to figure out the uh, how much is the renal uh, kind of impairment that this person has. Easiest is possibly urine albumin excretion with urine albumin to creatinine ratio, uh, serum creatinine, and then to find out calculate the GFR and. Uh, this is vexing because of the association of the other metabolic things is do I need to figure out the thyroid stimulating hormones, uh, especially in patients with type 1. Fortunately, you get to see less and less of these. And obviously, the other things, this is focused examination. As I said, do a chest x-ray, ECG, ECO. The anesthetic management, I will realize the the goal is that it should end well so whatever you do and whatever you are trying to uh, do the entire uh, thing is trying to see that everything ends well uh, what monitoring you do you do the standard physiological monitoring pulse oximeter eco electro ecg nibp temperature etc to advanced monitoring if only the patient status uh, comorbid status or the surgical reason tells you to do it. So let's not go into the details. The question is, how will you monitor the blood glucose in the perioperative period? I said, uh, what I'm trying to find out is how frequently will you do it and from where will you do it? Will you be taking it from the from the uh, vein, from the capillary, from the artery? Where? The uh, I need to first figure out what is the duration of surgery. Okay. Uh, suppose if it is a uh, short surgery uh, which is lasting for one to two hours, I will hmm. do a single intraoperative blood glucose, uh, okay. capillary blood glucose. I would take a sample from the ring finger of uh, of the arm where either of the arm opposite to the IV axis. So you do a capillary blood glucose. Yes. Sir. Okay. Suppose let us say that this is this is a surgery which is going to go on for four hours. What will you do now? You can do hourly glucose, CBG, or my more reliable thing would be to do an ABG. Okay. That's the trend of the uh, blood glucose. And okay. So for all kinds of patient, you will do capillary blood glucose and you say you will do it at hourly intervals. Right? Yes. Okay. I'll do one uh, ABG every three hour maybe or... I'll so go you, for hourly capillary blood glucose. You will do ABGs after Either one every, of, ABGs every three hours or a capillary blood glucose after one hour. So this is irrespective of what kind of control the person had. This is irrespective of the type of uh, medications or the type of surgery that this person uh, is going through or the physiological parameters that the person is uh having that is what you are trying to tell me right so if the patient has uh, poor uh, preoperative blood sugar control then i will prefer uh -huh. abg over the C uh, cbg okay i think no i think let's i think this is one thing that i think i i realize is something which does not come naturally to most people but if you look through this it is very very intuitive if the person is receiving insulin and if the person blood glucose level is less than 100 or the glucose is falling rapidly, it is then that you check blood sugar levels by a finger stick or you send the sample to the lab every hour or even more frequently. Okay. But if the person is stable and has not received insulin, most of your patients who come with oral hypoglycemic agent and has got a reasonable good control okay 
you can then check and you know that the preoperative values are normal then you need to check every two hours there is no hard and fast rule that you need to check every hour so and this again you can check it from the capillary blood sugar levels okay but suppose you are needing suppose you have uh, let me it is just not uh, less than 100 suppose the uh, you figured out that the sugar levels were 250 for which you gave iv insulin or you started an iv insulin infusion right it is then that you because you have given you started to give insulin that you start to check every hour okay am i clear on this if and all this you can do with capillary blood glucose but if the person is critically ill or is on a vasopressor or is hypotensive then it your capillary blood sugar level is not informative it is then that you have to send a venous sample or a arterial sample okay i will repeat this once more if they are on insulin preoperatively or intraoperatively one hourly if they have good physiological control blood pressures are okay you do capillary blood glucose interval one hour good control not on insulin two hour okay hypotensive or inotropes uh, then capillary blood glucose is not informative you have to do a venous sampling or an arterial sampling okay otherwise you don't need an arterial sampling for routine monitoring okay fine so what is the glycemic target that you're looking at so uh, within less than 140 Run. less than 140 capillary blood glucose yeah okay so that is you are going more towards the tighter control if you look at it most guidelines will tell you that it is around 150 and many people now say that you keep it between 140 to 180 is good enough try and see that it does not go above 180 try and see that it does not go less than 100 i think now you are looking at a very wide range as long as they are staying close to 150 you are good see react when do you react when do i react and give insulin it's only if it is much above 180 and definitely react if it is less than 100 anywhere between 100 and 108 to 180 if, if you find something is 105 you might check it every hour and then react if it is maybe 200 if you don't want to give check it maybe again after an hour and then react okay so how do you, I think I've given away the answer. So I think it's no point asking you now. How do you uh, 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 correct? What, actually, let me put it a very pointed question. How are you going to give insulin? Are you going to give bolus insulin? Are you give to, going to give IV insulin infusions? Are you going to try and give subcutaneous insulin? Or are you going to give intramuscular insulin? So this is multiple choice. Uh, in perioperative setting, I'll give bolus insulin. Insulin and, and then monitor if the sugar uh, regular insulin. Okay. And uh, uh, if uh, after even after bolus the sugar is not coming down, we can start the infusion. Okay, I think at least you agree that it has to be insulin and it has to be IV insulin. Subcutaneous insulin has no role in its management, and even the sliding scale algorithms have possibly have a very poor or variable control what works best and this is if you remember when we talked about when you are uh, having insulin and if they are on long acting insulin please do not stop long acting insulin and this is what where it comes from it is because if they have been on good control with a long acting insulin let that long acting insulin be given prior to surgery especially the night prior to surgery don't stop it because that maintains the glycemic control the best okay and then if you need to do anything then it is this short acting ones and this comes the vexing question which is a better anesthetic technique is general anesthesia better is regional anesthesia better is a combination of regional anesthesia and a com uh, general anesthesia better you will find that the answer is it depends upon the what type of surgery what is the patient factor what are your preferences what are the patient 
uh, new axial it has the theoretical benefit of reducing the stress response by this direct sympathetic block and reducing pain and thus reduce the post-operative insulin resistance and hyperglycemia but there is no evidence as of date to suggest that regional anesthesia alone or in combination with general anesthesia reduces mortality or any major complication uh, if you are using uh, a catheter based technique you have to remember that it comes with the price of infection as well okay so let us come back to our patient a 55 year old type 2 on oral hypoglycemics with good reason, uh, reasonable control, no angina palpitations. What will you do now? And you have uh, evaluated further good moderate functional status with an uh, ejection fraction of 55%, a normal LFT, normal lipid profile, a surgery which is being posted at 8 a.m. What are you going to hold any drugs and from when? What is your glycemic control plan? How will you monitor glucose? And what will you do in the post operative period? Surgery. Surgery posted at 8 a.m. Yeah. Uh, so uh, keep him uh, overnight on overnight fasting. So he will okay. receive all, all the scheduled oral uh, hypoglycemic agents uh, uh, in in the uh, night on the night before the surgery. If Perfect. Scheduled. And uh, yeah, and I'll keep him fasting because uh, uh, that is his usual uh, uh, dosing as per his usual dosing. Okay. And in the morning. Uh, 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 I will check his uh, 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 sugar level one hour prior to the surgery and then decide whether to uh, give uh, start any insulin and is, is there any requirement to start any or not. Absolutely. Uh, Very good. Okay. And after that, uh, uh, the drug holding, if the person is on insulin, then uh, as we have discussed, uh, if the patient is on a long acting insulin, then I will you, uh, this person is not on uh, not on insulin, just on oral hypoglycemic. So you don't bother about uh, insulin uh, uh, here. Yes, sir. So, so, no so don't sir. put so yourself in a problem where no problem exists. Yes, sir. So the post-operative, sir. Uh, uh, post-operative, uh, I will uh, uh, I I will find out how the patient is behaving during the intraoperative period, whether the sugar, uh, sugar levels are under control or they are on the higher side. And depending upon that, I will uh, determine uh, when when the post-operative oral hypoglycemic should be started. Because even in the post-operative period, there might be surgical orders for NBM uh, if it is yeah. a gastrointestinal surgery. Uh, so therefore, depending upon the NBM status which the surgeon advises and the need for it, I will decide on the oral glycemic. Perfect. I think I will agree with you. So do not give the morning dose. Glycemic control plan. I think you sit tight. Glucose monitoring. See, not on insulin, if it is good control, CBG is just too hourly. And you said, you rightly said, one hour prior to surgery, if the surgery is going beyond one hour, I might think of doing another CBG and finding out. Post-operative, if you can, the best bet is if you can start early feeding, you can resume the oral hypoglycemic agents. And if you do not, do not. So as long as they're fasting, I think very good, do not start the oral hypoglycemic agents. So let's look at a different day and a different patient and we'll wind up with this scenario, okay? A 55 year old, same, diabetes, oral hypoglycemia. this one is poorly controlled and has a strangulated hernia and needs an urgent laparotomy, okay? The blood sugar level is 386, urea is 86, creatinine 3.4, tachycardic, tachypneic, uh, saturations are poor, chest exercise, basal opacity, the ECG shows atrial fibrillation. Yes, okay. Sir, as it is an okay. emergency. And, and you have done an ABG and you find this is the ABG. pH of 7.1 with a base excess of minus 13 with a uh, large anion gap with a bicarbonate which is low. What will you do now? And uh, sugar sir, which is 386. What are you thinking? Like sir, urine ketone bodies I like to do. Mostly diabetic yeah. ketoacidosis. Very good. Yeah. So if it is diabetic ketoacidosis, what will you do? Whatever time is there, we'll plan for uh, optimization. Do it okay. And so what, what, what will be, how will you try to quickly optimize this person? Because you have also figured out that this is a strangulated hernia. So you might have Sorry. a gangrenous gut in a, a few moments time. Sorry. You have not much time, so you have to optimize quickly. How will you quickly optimize? Sir, this patient will be fluid deficient. So we started correcting fluid around one liter per hour. 
Okay. What fluid will you give? And, uh, RL or normal saline? Normal saline can be given. Normal saline. Okay. What else? So one is fluids. What else one will you do? Are there potas potassium. We'll potassium? check for potassium and potassium. Okay. Yes. Very good. So you should be looking for the potassium values from the blood gas or from the serum values and uh, uh, correcting potassium. And so fluids, for, potassium, uh, and correct. next insulin for sugar correct. Very good. Insulin. And insulin for sugar correction. Absolutely. So this is exactly what you need to do: isotonic saline, potassium, insulin. If you're looking at diabetes ketosis, you find the four columns. One is fluids. The second is potassium. The third is insulin and bicarbonate is query. You give bicarbonate provided the pH is less than 6.9. Okay. So this is the pillars of the management of DKA. Fluids, very good. You said if it, there is severe hypovolemia, correct it with one liter per hour of 0.9% normal uh, saline. If it is mild hypovolemia, then try to find out the serum sodium status. If the serum sodium status is low, uh, sodium is less, then you give 0.9% saline. If it is high or moderate, it's normal, then go to 0.45% saline. Don't overload. If the person is in shock, then do him, then in, they do the invasive monitoring and think of starting pressures. Okay, so this is about fluids. What about insulin? Uh, what about potassium? You have to check potassium. I think the catch, I think what I was trying to get from you was, what will you do if the potassium is too low? Will you give insulin or will you not give insulin? This is the catch. If you look at the left hand side, if the potassium is less than 3.3, hold insulin, give potassium, correct it, get it above 3.3 and then give insulin. Otherwise, you run that very high risk of uh, decreasing the potassium further. Your target is to of potassium has to be above 4, less than 5. And if it is between 3.3 to 5.3, you give 20 to 30 milli equivalents with every liter of IV fluid. If the potassium is above 5.53, do not give potassium, only give NS. Okay, clear? And before you correct potassium, the other thing that you need to figure out is uh, what is the urine output? Is there an establishment of a renal uh, uh, flow? Insulin, uh, I, I, I'm not very comfortable with the subcutaneous route. I rather would go for only the IV route. What is the dose? You give a regular insulin of 0.1 unit per kg as bolus and then start an infusion of 0.1 per kg per hour. And, uh, while do this, keep checking sugars. If the sugar levels do not come down by 50 to 70 grams every hour, then increase the dose further. Okay, so that's about insulin. Uh, insulin, again, I'll just recap. IV insulin, how much you give? 0.1 unit per kg as bolus, 0.1 unit per kg per hour as infusion. Check sugar levels. If the sugar levels have not coming down by 50 to 70 per hour, just double the dose, the next one that you get. Okay, your target should be 200 and below. Once it comes to 200, reduce the dose to, dose to 0.02 to 0 0.05 units uh, per kg per hour. Okay, so that's about insulin. Not very difficult to remember. Uh, and the last thing, bicarbonate. Simple. If it is above 6.9, do not give bicarbonate as per recommendations. Below 6.9, give bicarbonate. Okay. So that is about the management of diabetic ketoacidosis and the emergency management. Sir, at what pre-op uh, HbA1c should we take the patient? I think uh, this was a part of our presentation. Uh, if you look at it, if you look at data, uh, uh, American Diabetes Association does not give you any figure. The Australian Society and the Anesthesia Society of Great Britain and Ireland tells you to uh, say that uh, uh, you get it down to 8.5 and you delay elective surgery if the value is above 8.5. Uh, 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 above 8.5. But uh, then what are you, what target are you? Will you take this person up? If it is 7, will you take this person up? If it is 7.5, I think we still don't have 
a clear cut verdict on this okay sir thank you yeah uh, what about adjusting local anesthetic in diabetic patients because uh, i think if, if i think the way i look at it and most most people look at it is uh, if if you are thinking that this person has neuropathy or assume that this person has neuropathy uh, the best option to go for would be that okay if if normally i would have used 0.5% bupivacaine and i would have used say 20 ml of 0.5% i'm giving a hypothetical situation in this scenario i'll possibly use something like 0.375% of bupivacaine 20 ml so use less amount of local anesthetics or if you want to give 0.5% then give maybe 15 ml so reduce it by around 70% to 75% but the, you won't find a clear cut uh, it, you have to figure out for yourself how do we calculate the uh, insulin required perioperatively say for example perio uh, intra of the sugar is around 250 how, how do you decide how much insulin to give to bring it down i to think uh, uh, there is a very cumbersome way of calculating but uh, i think most people would not go by that what most people would the rule of thing is if it is anything between say uh, say something above 200 that you are trying to react then i think you just give it around 0.02 units per kg and then figure out and give it and then monitor it after an hour and then react to it so what about uh, those okay uh, sir or so the patient and in his sliding scale treatments uh huh patient is on sliding scale then we can use that as a guideline to give the bolus doses of insulin perioperatively uh, uh, i don't think that's a very good idea a sliding scale insulin is not a great idea at all because you see the seesaw of the glycemic response because of a sliding scale you, it goes high you give insulin yes, more sir. it goes low you give sugar and again yes, it goes sir. high you give insulin so it's not a good so that which is why people if you find that then it is worthwhile that you try and figure out what has been the requirement and then go on a long acting insulin based upon that requirement and then take up this patient okay sir. so we glycemic regimens go what about those the gik regimen velo regimen what I, i think all these are institutional based there is uh, there is no clear verdict as to which one is good and which one is bad i think it it's ultimately depend i think it has become very simple uh, let us put it this way if a person was on oral hypoglycemic agents and the person is well controlled you just don't have to do anything you give the oral hypoglycemic agents till the person was fasting you'll find if the control was good he will continue with that control you don't have to do anything if the person was on a long acting insulin and if they have been on insulin you will find that they are not been on a uh, uh, short acting insulin isn't it they have been on long acting insulin let them be on that same long acting insulin don't change it let it go then you monitor it two hourly one hourly if you only find that it is overshooting 200 220 react you don't have to do anything Okay. as you said it is there is no thing okay. okay. because as you say as we realized as per the discussion there is no such thing that if it is less than 140 that person is going to do very well if it is more than 240 the person is going to die nothing of that sort isn't it what people have realized is the variability is more risky than an absolute number it is not good to have somebody going to 80 260 110 230 190 90 210 that is possibly worse last case in the uh, hello laparotomy with uh, strangulated uh, hernia with laparotomy mm -hmm. ha sir uh, what uh, because the diabetes uh, is the very long case in the exam sir and mm -hmm. we have we have to a uh, very uh, different question sir mm -hmm. so would you have have been your ideal approach in this case sir? With which GK one presentation ah, so, so as i said as i said if if you so the thing is i think that scenario you have you figure out 
that you you have a very high blood sugar levels as i said like i say something like 300 more than 300 moment you have somebody with a more than 300 it should immediately strike you am i looking at something like a dka or am i looking at a hyperosmolar state okay how do you f figure out is one is looking at ketones in the urine doing a blood gas to find out what is the ph uh, and uh, what is the metabolic uh, an anion gap or what is the base excess? You figure out it's DKA and see both for DKA and for the hyperosmolic state, the management regime is nearly the same, isn't it? It's IV fluids, insulin, potassium, bicarbonate. And so if I would quickly look at that, I will stabilize the, uh, the patient's hydration status. I will get the potassium to something close to 4 and between 4 and 5. I'll try to get uh, urine flow going, which I'm then certain that there is organ perfusion happening. I repeat the ABG and I correct the, I find that the ABG is correcting. And then, because even a strangulated hernia will give you two hours, four hours, six hours at time. So I'll correct this and then take up this person for the, for the because I cannot wait for 24 hours. Then the you can have, you can have a lead to a, a gangrenous cut. Yes, sir. Yes, my question was about the urgency. Means, means what time should we wait for in this case? I, I, I can You, it's not a, it's not like a T20 match that you have just 20 overs to play. If you have corrected, if you can correct the pH and the, get the pH get to 7.3 in say two hours time, then you can take this person up. If the potassium has become four, patient is passing urine, the mentation status has become fine, then you can take up in two hours time. It, you, uh, to get to these targets, you are taking six hours, then you take six hours and go in for uh, the surgery after six hours. Okay, so you can't say that I, I have only two hours time. I don't think that's an approach. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pankaj. Sir, hello. Uh, yes. I have a doubt, sir. Sir, if there is, uh, if we are giving a light uh, breakfast, for example, we are giving uh, just some toast and uh, black coffee or something like that, and we have mm -hmm. six hours, it's a high carb, low fat, then uh, do we give uh, <laughs> oh, entire, That's a good question. Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, maybe not. Uh, they, I think the reasonable thing to understand is when is the surgery? If the surgery is right late in the evening, then it, it may not be a great idea to give the whole entire dose. I might give half the dose. But, uh, or, uh, you see, uh, why do you want to give light breakfast unless uh, there is something which the, the, the surgical pathology is such that you don't want to have the person a great meal otherwise i think yes. uh, figure out what is the normal breakfast for that person and he ha he or she has the same breakfast and then you continue with the same thing and then you uh, maybe two hourly you check blood sugar levels till the person comes into the uh, OR. operation theater yeah because you see with all these oral hypoglycemic agents it will not cause a rapid or a sharp decline in blood sugar unless they yes. are con co uh, completely fasting. On a fasting state, you give them, you'll have a precipitous fall. Sir, uh, sir pre-operatively and post-operatively, sir, also, sir, uh, normally, sir, do we uh, keep it as two-hourly monitoring of the capillary blood sugar? Uh, when? In the? Uh, sir, it's a pre-operatively pre and post-operatively. Sir, uh, 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 post-operatively. Post-operatively, if the person has been stable with the blood sugar levels, uh, you can continue with the same regime that you had in the intraoperative period. And then you find that every after maybe four recordings, you find that they're still the same. You can think of extending it and making it three hourly, four hourly. Uh, Pre-operatively, if, if it, if, if from the time, if you see, if, if the, uh, find out what the person's usual monitoring used to be. The person was not monitoring every two hourly and the person is on the same regime, I would not possibly do it. 
uh, is uh, taken a um, uh, uh, dinner and is taken the evening before uh, uh, meals then i would just do it before the person comes in for surgery in the morning that's all thank you sir thank you